Good morning. So in this video, we're going to introduce the lymphatic system and immunity. So we'll, this video will basically take us through innate immunity, which I believe is 22-4. Um, and then we'll do a separate video for adaptive immunity. So as we look at the lymphatic system, like there we go, right? We're looking at all the cells, tissues, and organs um, that are responsible for producing, maintaining, distributing lymphocytes, right? And these lymphocytes, things like B cells and T cells, um, are going to be part of what we call specific immunity, right? A big part of how we resist um, infections and disease. And, and we'll talk about that more in the next video. But I did want to make sure we understand that, right? It's, it's the lymphatic system because it takes care of lymphocytes, right? Now, um, that being said, one of the big things it does is also maintaining fluid balance in the body. So it's going to return some of those interstitial fluids that we talked about with the blood vessels, right? So as fluid was filtered out of the capillaries, we saw that quite a bit of it was reabsorbed, but not all of it. And so we're going to see the lymphatic system involved in returning that fluid um, to the cardiovascular system. So we carry a fluid in this system called lymph right? It's just a plasma-like fluid. It, the, what gets people is it was called plasma when it was in the blood, right? And then it leaks out and we call it extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid. And then when it moves into these lymph vessels, it's the same fluid, but now we call it lymph, right? It's all the same thing. So we'll take a look um, at how that works. We'll talk a little bit about these vessels, um, and then also some of the lymph tissues and organs, right? So these lymphatic vessels you kind of see spread throughout the body here. Um, they are basically carrying the, the lymph, that interstitial fluid that we're trying to return. So it's picking it up in the tissues and returning it eventually uh, to a vein. The nice thing about this setup, right, is one, we get to return that excess fluid. So you don't constantly just swell and swell and swell. Um, it also acts as a way to transport, transport lymphocytes. So they can move out of the blood into the tissue, back to the lymph, back to the blood, right? They can move around. Um, it helps us, we talked about this with the cardiovascular system, that, that ability to filter things out of the blood is what's going to make it even easier to distribute things like hormones, nutrients, um, wastes, um, etc. Um, and this lymphatic system also helps us maintain blood volume. So not only do we not want to just keep swelling, but we also want to return that fluid to the cardi cardiovascular system to maintain blood volume, which then helps us maintain blood pressure. We also um, need to take a look, they're showing on this picture as well, things like the spleen and the thymus and the lymph nodes and tonsils. So we'll talk about um, these lymphatic tissues and lymphatic organs as well. Um, basically, the, the big difference, I would say, between a lymphatic tissue and an organ um, is the organ is actually going to have a capsule around it where the tissue is a little more um, diffuse. And we'll see that embedded um, in the walls of other organs a lot of times. So when we think about tissues, we'll talk about the tonsils. That's actually some kind of more diffuse lymphatic tissue. Um, and then things like this, the spleen and the thymus um, are some of the lymph organs. So these organs do um, produce and store lymphocytes, um, and we'll look at that process. Okay, so let's jump in here. So here's a look. I stole this from another book because here's your, oh, I didn't even put your picture in. Um, I think it's still 22 too. Um, a look at um, what these lymphatic vessels look like particularly, um, we're going to start out in what we call lymphatic capillary. So this lymphatic capillary is not quite the same as one of the capillaries in the cardiovascular system. So they tend to be um, larger in diameter. They have very thin walls, right? That's a similarity. Um, and then this is kind of interesting, right? They actually originate as little pockets, right? Almost like a cul-de-sac. Um, so there's no flow through. A lymphatic capillary starts basically as a dead end embedded um, in the tissue. 
It is made up of endothelial cells, um, but unlike the capillary, it actually lacks a basement membrane. Um, lots of these lymphatic capillaries in places like the small intestine, I mean, they're spread throughout your body, but in the small intestine, we give them a separate name. We call them lacteals. We'll see a ton here in the small intestine because this is actually our only route for really absorbing uh, lipids. So lipids don't dissolve in water well. They don't go into the bloodstream right away. They're actually going to move through um, these lymphatic vessels before they enter circulation. So from that capillary, we would then enter a small lymphatic vessel. It actually ends up being similar to a vein. Okay, so notice things like um, they have valves in them. Um, we then move on. Oh, I also wanted to point out, sorry, before I move out on these lymphatic capillaries, maybe this is the best picture to do this in. Um, notice that the endothelial cells overlap. Um, it kind of acts as a valve or like a one-way door. So fluid can move into the lymphatic capillary, but then those um, endothelial cells kind of any lymph pushing back is actually going to close that little flap. Um, and that's separate from the valves, right, that we'll see, particularly as we start moving into lymphatic vessels that are preventing backflow um, down this lymphatic circulation. This is what happens uh, when the lymphatic system fails. So a very visual representation um, of this system to be able to drain fluids um, from from the body. Um, so this is actually a result of a parasitic infection that damages some of these lymph vessels um, and, and is, is preventing the removal of that fluid. Um, elephantiasis is the name of this disorder. Okay, so from those small lymphatic vessels, we do start moving into some more major um, lymphatic vessels. Um, don't, there's a ton of them, right? And we don't need to know all of them, but you should realize you have a lot of major lymphatic vessels that stay a little more superficial. So they would be um, subcutaneous, just deep to the skin. You would find lots of these in places like um, mucous membranes. So lining the respiratory system, the digestive system, um, urinary reproductive, things like that, um, as well as in the serous membranes. So places like the pleural cavity, pericardial cavity, those sorts of places, right? We're going to remove um, excess fluid. You also have deeper lymphatic uh, vessels, and those tend to run kind of in parallel with arteries, veins, nerves. They the lymphatic vessels, even these bigger ones, they tend to have kind of this pale golden appearance. And remember, they're much more like veins, so they kind of collapse. They're pretty difficult to find um, in dissection. So the stuff I want to have you focus in more, right, is as all of these different um, lymphatic vessels are, are moving together, and you can call them ducts as well, lymphatic ducts, um, they're eventually basically all going to kind of... Um, almost all fused together. So notice what they're showing you here is the upper right quadrant of the body really gets drained by this right lymphatic duct, right? And we actually see that right here um, dumping into the right subclavian vein. On the left-hand side of the body, and I guess the right lower side of the body as well, so the other three quarters of the body, um, all of that lymph is going to come together in what's called the thoracic duct. Um, so it's collecting everything inferior of the diaphragm and then also the upper left um, quadrant of the body. Um, this is going to dump into the right. Thought I was going to sneeze, maybe. Into the right, I'm sorry, into the left subclavian vein, right? So you see that entering into this. Um, subclavian vein here. Now, um, and I will point out the, the base of this thoracic duct is kind of expanded. You see lots of different um, kind of trunks coming in here. The cisterna chili is that little expansion um, or sinus there. So this is how we're actually returning all of that fluid to the cardiovascular system, right? It's going to be collected throughout the body um, and enters the venous system. One of the nice things that happens, though, is before 
we get there, we're going to go ahead and filter it. We're going to screen it. So the lymphatic system, we said, really focuses on the, the kind of care and provision, I suppose, of these lymphocytes. And so we'll get into these more when we talk about adaptive immunity. But remember, what we're looking at here are things like B cells, T cells, and natural killer cells. And these are going to be constantly looking for invading microorganisms. So what we end up doing then is our, in our lymphatic tissues and lymphatic organs, we're basically going to filter and screen the lymph, right, as it's traveling through those lymphatic vessels. So when we talk about lymphoid tissue or lymphatic tissue, here we're talking basically about a connective tissue, typically reticular, filled with reticular fibers, if you remember that um, from the tissue chapter. So we have connective tissue that's really dominated by lymphocytes, right? Lots of B cells, T cells, natural killer cells embedded in there. Um, so here we're looking at a lymphoid nodule. Notice um, it's also called a tonsil. These lymphoid nodules, they don't have a fibrous capsule, and so this is still lymphatic tissue. It's not truly um, an organ here. So what we'll see is in the these lymphoid nodules, when we see them in the respiratory, lining the upper respiratory tract, typically we call them um, a sinus. We will see these very richly in any of our mucous membranes, right? So dige again, digestive, respiratory, urinary, um, reproductive. A lot of times the, these lymphoid nodules aren't even as pronounced as what we see here in the tonsils. And so what scientists have started calling it is MALT, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. So any of those mucous membranes might have a really rich distribution of, of these lymphoid nodules. In particular, when you get into the small intestine, sometimes they refer to it as GALT, gut-associated lymphoid tissue. It's still MALT, but it's specifically um, in the GI tract. Um, and even more specifically, a lot of times lining the small intestine will refer to payers patches. And these are pretty obvious histologically. Again, just um, deep to the mucous membrane where all this absorption is taking place. Remember, you have lots and lots of bacteria that are inside the lumen, the, op the hole the whole, there we go, of the intestine, and you want glucose and salts and all these things to be absorbed, but you don't want those bacteria gaining access to the body. And so you have this very rich distribution of malt, including what we would call payer's patches. Um, the appendix also falls under this. A lot of people I know talk about the appendix as if it's a vestigial organ, something that used to have a purpose and no longer has that purpose, um, but it does seem that it actually has a really rich distribution of malt, and so we could say it's actually part of the lymphatic system here. So there's your tonsils. We will look for these in lab, I think with the respiratory system. Um, typically, um, when people are talking about their tonsils being swollen, it's actually these um, I feel like they switched those around. Shouldn't the palatine tonsils be on the palate? Oh, it is. Okay. I see what we're looking here. Look at this picture. <laughs> so um, here's the palate, right? Hard palate up front, soft palate in the back. And the palatine tonsil um, is kind of hanging down there with the uvula. The pharyngeal tonsils um, are way up high, actually up in the nasopharynx. Um, and then the lingual tonsil is at the base of the tongue. Okay. So that picture's art. Right. Okay, let's look at lymph nodes. So lymph nodes are truly organs, right? They actually are um, contained inside of a connective tissue capsule. And notice what's going on here. And then this is the image from your textbook, 22.6. Um, basically, in all of our lymph nodes, we have lymph being brought to the lymph node through an afferent lymphatic vessel. Remember, afferent, so just like neurons, afferent is, is moving towards um, our lymph node, and then we'll see that same lymph being carried away through an efferent um, vessel. But by then, it's already been filtered. 
And so the idea here is you're bringing the lymph through this lymph node and you're bringing it past all sorts of immune system cells. So macrophages and dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are also arise from monocytes. Both of these are phagocytic cells. They're great at activating um, adaptive immunity. So bring the lymph, filter it past macrophages. Um, in these lymph nodes, you have tons of um, B cells. And again, not super worried that you know the exact locations of these, but it's really rich in B cells, um, in T cells, um, and even in antibodies. Okay. And so if you have an infection and you feel lymph nodes um, getting enlarged, right, or sometimes, and a lot of times these lymph nodes um, are in places like the axillary region or the inguinal region, um, anytime those are enlarged, you would think there's probably some sort of um, infection going on, some sort of inflammatory response. It can also be one of the first um, indications that there is cancer. This is one of the places that cancer will often metastasize to. Anyway, lymph nodes, it's purifying this lymph before it reaches veins. So this is actually um, pretty clever. Anything that you're collecting from the tissues, you get a chance to kind of screen it. The other thing that happens is these lymph nodes act as kind of an early warning system. So what we'll see as we start talking more about the cells here in the lymphatic system is a lot of times they're releasing um, different cytokines, different chemical signals, um, and so they're able to kind of alert uh, neighboring tissues, neighboring lymph nodes. So it serves as kind of an early warning system uh, to infection. So the thymus, we see the thymus sitting here just above the heart. I think a lot of us saw that in the cat. Um, this is also an organ. It's enclosed in the capsule. This is the one that we said kind of shrinks with age. Um, and the T cells develop here. So it's considered part of the lymphatic system because it is hosting and helping T cells to mature. We talked about it with the endocrine system because it also, stim it also releases hormones, um, particularly thymosins, which stimulate the T cells um, to, to mature and develop. So it's one of these organs, you know, we break the body up into these chapters, like these systems are all separate. But this is a really good place to remember that all of these systems are really integrated and sometimes it's not so easy to just kind of um, decide to put it in one box. And so, yeah, this basically um, fills roles in both the lymphatic system and the endocrine system. Um, the spleen. So the spleen um, is another uh, lymphatic organ. It does have a capsule, um, though it is very fragile. This capsule is not particularly strong. Um, you can damage the spleen with blunt trauma, um, particularly, you know, big wrecks, big accidents, um, and things like having mono, which would actually enlarge the spleen in response to that infection, um, can make it even more fragile. Sorry, dog freaking out. Um, so, yeah, having the spleen enlarged due to something like mono can make it even more fragile. So this would be the classic example is like, the high school football player, he's contracted mono, he's not supposed to play because a lesser impact could actually rupture um, the spleen. And the spleen is a little different in that the spleen isn't filtering lymph, the spleen is filtering blood. It's still part of the lymphatic system because what we're going to see is as you get down kind of into the the deep histology here um, is that again, it's housing lots and lots of lymphocytes. So one of the spleen's main jobs, I mean, it filters blood. And one of the things it's looking for is actually the older kind of worn out red blood cells, ones that aren't gonna actually fold very nicely and fit through capillaries. And remember from the blood chapter, we try to take them out of circulation before they rupture because we want to recycle those nutrients, right? Remember the the iron is going to get sent back to the bone marrow and then the, the protein portion of hemoglobin um, is gonna get recycled, part of it, it ends up as bile, okay. Um, but the spleen, right, has tons again of um, things like macrophages, dendritic cells, B cells, T cells. Um, and so again, it can initiate an immune response um, here. There's your book's picture um, of the spleen as well. 
Oh, and thymus. We already did that. Okay, so I did like this image. I think I'm in your way. Maybe down here. Um, figure 22.9. It's kind of hard to see. It's too small probably to have as a slide here, but it does a really nice job of kind of showing you all these different um, kind of parts of the lymphatic system, right? So they're trying to show you here um, how all these um, lymph vessels are going to bring uh, the lymph through the lymph node. We get it filtered. We return it to the venous circulation, right? Pointing out specifically that lymph capillaries in the small intestine are called lacteals, and that is also going to come back um, to the venous system. We see the spleen that we just talked about filtering the blood. Um, they're showing the role here of bone marrow, and this is going to be really early in the development um, of some of our lymphocytes. So we'll look at how the B cells and T cells arise from stem cells in the bone marrow. Here's the thymus, right? Um, some of those immature T cells actually migrate through the blood to the thymus, right? And they leave as mature T cells able to actually do their job. And so um, a kind of a nice summary here. Okay. And again, all those then mature, this is what this last one is showing, all those mature B and T cells, right? They arise from bone marrow. They develop either in the bone marrow or the thymus, um, depending on which cell type. And they spread out throughout the body into all these different lymphatic tissues, lymph nodes, lymph nodules, tonsils, the spleen, right? Um, et cetera. And they're able to kind of move in and out of those tissues through the bloodstream. So I thought figure 22.9 was kind of a nice summary there. Okay, so we are going to keep rolling here, and we want, we're going to start by looking um, at the innate defenses. So as we move into this big idea of immunity, right, what we're looking for is the ability to resist disease. But how this ends up happening in the body is it really gets split into two main branches. Um, the one we would call, your book calls it innate immunity. I tend to call it innate defense. Typically what we mean by immunity are these adaptive defenses, right? Um, utilizing things like B cells and T cells where we gain immunological memory, where you only get sick from the same microbe once, right? Subsequent infections don't lead to illness. That's what we typically call immunity. And so that would be part of this adaptive response. So what I want to talk about um, to, to wrap up section, I think it's 22.4, um, are these innate defenses. So innate defenses are non-specific. They do not distinguish one type of, of threat from another, right? So they don't care whether it's H1N1 or H3N2 influenza. They can tell it's foreign um, and they want to go after it. Um, so we're going to look at things in these innate defenses like physical barriers, um, Phagocytic cells like macrophages, they don't care what bacteria it is. They're just going to engulf it um, and a whole slew of things. We'll talk about some different chemicals, the inflammatory response, fever, right? All of these um, are innate. The other thing that you should think about innate defenses, so they're nonspecific, right? They don't care what the microbe is. Um, and they're basically things that you're born with, right? These don't have to like... Um, they don't require a previous exposure to some infectious agent. You just have them. They're ready to go. Okay. And again, these adaptive defenses, they're specific, right? If they've seen H1N1 before, then you have immunity. But if you get H3N2 influenza, right, we're going to have to spend some time mounting this immune response. So they're specific, right? They protect against particular threats. They require exposure, right? You're not just born immune to influenza, H1N1. You actually have to have um, exposure to the, that particular antigen. I will also point out these adaptive defenses then are where we see the lymphocytes, the B cells and the T cells, right? And they're wandering through tissues and we see how they might hang out um, in different lymphatic tissues, lymphatic organs, but they're traveling, moving in and out um, of circulation, etc. Okay, so there's a lot in here, but we're just going to get through innate defenses and then I'll make a separate uh, video so we can all have a break. You, of course, can 
hit pause at any time. Okay, so innate defenses. Again, I've pulled this out of another um, publication, but I think this is a really nice summary um, of what your book is talking about. So here we see a list of what, like seven different innate defenses, non-specific, and you're born with them, right? So the first one would be physical barriers, right? Actually intact skin and mucous membranes. This barrier, think about um, how, um, how many layers there are, for example, uh, in skin, right? We looked at even just the epidermis, the stratum corneum, that superficial layer. Um, it's all dead cells, right? It's not going to be a great habitat for, for microbes to survive in, right? It's, it's dry, it's slightly acidic, um, all, all these things, okay? Um, it's filled, they're all filled with this really difficult, uh, this tough protein called keratin, right? And that's going to help um, this be a very good physical barrier to microbes um, entering the body. And then of course we have all these accessory structures. If you look at different, you know, sweat glands, um, that those secretions, um, maybe in tears, um, are keeping that mucous membrane clear. You actually flush a lot of these mucous membranes. Urine keeps the urethra um, mucous membrane clear. Um, yeah, again, tears, the, there's an the actual enzyme in tears called lysozyme, which breaks down bacterial cell walls. If you think about um, sweat coming out of some of these glands in the skin, it's typically slightly acidic, um, so not a great habitat for most microbes. Um, mucus that you would be producing um, on the mucous membranes like snot and stuff like that, right? It's, it's trapping microbes and then it's flushing um, out of the body. Um, you have on the mucous membrane in the respiratory tract, you have ciliated cells that actually help propel um, that mucus and any microbes that have been tra trapped up and out of the respiratory system, right? Instead of letting it settle down into the lungs. So physical barrier wise, you're born with a bunch of defenses, right? From um, microbes, particularly I'm thinking bacteria, but I suppose viruses as well, from gaining entry to the body. Heck, worms, fungus, whatever. Microbes, um, pathogens, microbes capable of causing disease, pathogens, um, you're born with these physical defenses against pathogen entry. Okay, the next one they're talking about here are phagocytes. Um, phagocytes are a group of cells that engulf and destroy pathogens, right? We have, ooh, I'm in the way again. We have two main categories here. Um, actually, sorry, more than two. Um, the neutrophils, this is the most common white blood cell. You saw this in the blood chapter. And there we go again, right? Is it blood or is it immune system? It's both. So neutrophils, um, I tend to think of these as little kamikaze pilots, right? Because they are going to go ahead and do phagocytosis. Um, but, and your book says that they often die after a single um, phagocytic event. So engulfing one bacteria. I've more commonly seen up to like a dozen um, bacteria might be engulfed, but it does self-destruct. So when it engulfs that microbe, right, it's using some gnarly chemicals, things like superoxide or hydrogen peroxide, right, uh, things we might classify as free radicals. So it's using free radicals, it's using enzymes, um, different chemicals to actually destroy that bacteria, and eventually it actually um, destroys itself in that process as well. Eosinophils, um, Again, we talked about a little bit with the cardiovascular system. Um, they typically go after after multicellular parasites. You can consider them a phagocytic cell, but usually what they're attacking is too big to actually be engulfed. And so they'll often kind of scoot up next to it and use, again, things like um, nitric oxide, different enzymes to destroy um, those parasites. The star of the phagocytic world is the macrophage, right? So macrophage literally means big eater. Um, and so this phagocytic cell um, is, is going to, um, again, engulf bacteria um, and destroy them with a variety of different enzymes. Um, but these guys can just keep going and going. They're actually much longer lived 
uh, than the neutrophils. So again, monocyte derived, right? We saw them as monocytes in the, in the bloodstream. Once they move into tissues, we call them uh, macrophages, right? A lot of tissues are sheltering kind of these visiting macrophages. So they've moved out of the bloodstream um, right, so they're saying some are floating around, um, those would be the monocytes in the blood. Some of them become uh, fixed. A lot of times uh, these macrophages are kind of moving in and out. So if you hear people talking about the reticuloendothelial system, this is this connective tissue um, that's really common to see macrophages kind of move in and out of. Um, you do have some specialized um, I guess monocytes like microglia, if you remember those from the nervous system, they're in the brain. They're basically a fixed macrophage. They're stuck in the brain. They're not coming back out because of the blood-brain barrier. Um, in the skin, we see um, a series of cells called dendritic cells or Langerhans cells. Your book probably called them dendritic cells. Um, they're embedded um, in the epithelium of the skin. So great place, right? Another way um, to kind of reinforce that physical barrier. Um, but they're all capable of moving around. So they're using chemotaxis, right? They're actually sensing chemicals from these pathogens or sometimes from the immune system. They can follow that towards the site of infection. Um, they will then, right, if they're in circulation, they'll actually like adhere to the capillary wall and start um, crawling, right? They use an amoeboid movement. So instead of just getting like flung right past the site of infection, because you're being carried by, really rapidly by the bloodstream, as they start sensing they're getting closer, they stick to the capillaries, um, cell walls, they start crawling um, towards the chemical stimulant. Um, and then they use a process called diapedesis, where they're able to squeeze out of the capillary um, between cells. Anyway, um, they can engulf quite a few microbes uh, in their lifetime. Oh, so this is that reticuloendothelial system, and this is actually a really nice image to remind us of the relationship between the blood um, and the lymphatic system. So what they're showing you here is that capillary and how we have filtration. So we see some stuff moving out and reabsorption, but of course filtration is going to exceed reabsorption. And so instead, a bunch of that fluid ends up becoming extracellular fluid. What they're pointing out is that throughout your body, you have this connective tissue and white blood cells are gonna be able to move in and out of that. And they're calling that this reticuloendothelial system. I think your book also points out that maybe we're realizing um, that's not exactly true. And I mean, I mean, it's true, but it's not like a system unto itself. And so, they're starting to call it more like the mononuclear phagocyte system. Anyway, again, some of these things don't fit in nice little boxes, nice little chapters like we want them to realize that, that white blood cells can move out of the bloodstream, hang out in tissues. They can move back into the lymphatic um, system when they want to, right? They can just go with some of that extracellular fluid um, back into the lymphatics and get returned. So that's, this is kind of nice, right? They're showing extracellular fluid when you're not in the bloodstream. And then once you're in the lymphatics, we would call that fluid lymph. Okay. So immunological surveillance. Um, this is going to be conducted by cells called natural killer cells. Now natural killer cells are kind of, um, interesting because they're actually lymphocytes. Like if you look at the, the lineage of all of our white blood cells, you'll notice that natural killer cells come from a lymphoid stem cell and they're like cousins with B cells and T cells, but they're involved in innate defenses, right? Which is very different than our other um, lymphocytes. So basically these natural killer cells um, are kind of constantly circulating and we call it immunological surveillance because they're looking for the bad guys and they recognize um, these foreign cells bacteria virus infected cells right so it could be your own cell that they recognize um, is infected with a virus they can pick up on cancers right they're looking for these proteins and Again, this is non-specific. So what ends up happening, particularly if you think about microbial pathogens, is they actually 
the what the natural killer cell picks up on is what's called a PAMP, a pathogen associated molecular pattern. So basically, even though there's individual differences in all these bad guys, it's like they have the same trench coat on or whatever. And so um, the natural killer cell is able to recognize them for that. And so what they do, so here we see um, a natural killer cell kind of scooted up against um, an infected cell. It, it's a eukaryotic cell, so I'm assuming it's like a virally infected self cell. Um, and it secretes some chemicals that are called perforins. So it's like shooting little holes into the cell. And once that cell membrane is um, uh, broken, water can rush in, right? We lose selective permeability. Um, it's formed these pores and the cell is going to undergo lysis. So that's kind of a fun one. Okay. Um, interferons. So interferons, um, they're chemical messengers um, that typically their main role is against viral infections. So what they're going to do is a virally infected cell. This isn't, this isn't a special cell. This is any of your cells. Once infected by a virus is going to release this chemical called an interferon, and it's attempting to interfere with the viral replication. And so basically it ends up alerting neighboring cells um, that there's a virus, right? And to basically try to um, batten down the hatches and keep the virus um, from infiltrating them as well. So yeah, I don't have a great <laughs> picture there. Um, they, they help the neighbors like build a better fence, right? Like, hey, there's a virus coming. That was kind of what I was going for there. Um, sometimes they're grouped with other kind of chemical defenses in the innate immune system. So um, some of these chemicals are getting released, kind of attracting phagocytes or sometimes tagging um, the pathogen so that something like a macrophage comes um, and finds it. So there's other chemicals, um, but I guess we're just talking about interferon. So um, virally infected cells, telling their neighbors to protect themselves. Um, okay, complement. So complement is a series of proteins. They're inactive. They're just circulating around in the blood and they complement the activity of antibodies. So they're nonspecific. We'll talk about them here. Um, sometimes you can actually just directly find um, a pathogen and attack it with complement, but it's often something where an antibody has attached itself to, say, the outside of a bacterium, and that's the signal um, for complement to come in. So it complements the activity um, of antibodies. And so um, two different pictures here. Your Get myself out of the way. Your book um, did a nice job of kind of laying out these different um, pathways, right? How this might happen. And so this is where I was saying um, often what they're calling the classical pathway. Um, this is when the complement protein attaches to an antibody that's already kind of tagged the cell. Um, this alternative pathway is the spontaneous one where it's able to recognize um, a foreign microbe uh, directly. Excuse me. Um, I kind of like this picture because it shows what ends up really happening. I guess both of them show it, but um, so you have this series of circulating proteins and they're going to come and kind of arrange themselves in this nice ring in the cell membrane of the pathogen. And again, once you've disrupted that selective permeability of a membrane, that cell is more um, apt to rupture in if you've taken micro, um, gram negative cells, if you can embed this in the outer membrane and you lose selective permeability, then you're able to more easily um, target the cell. In a, a eukaryotic cell, right, if you lyse the membrane, the cell is going to explode. Um, in our uh, bacteria, since they have a cell wall, we're still going to need to do a little more um, activity on them. Anyway, don't get too lost in that, right? It creates what's called the membrane attack complex. It creates this pore um, in a cell membrane, which is leading to lysis. Okay, 
Um, the inflammatory response. This is a super important um, innate defense. And I say it's super important because we've all experienced inflammation, right? We know a little more about it. And we're starting to find actually quite a few diseases where chronic inflammation is problematic. So it's really important to kind of understand what this process is. So the idea of inflammation is actually to limit the spread of infection. Um, and so what you end up seeing, right, if you think about signs and symptoms, right, signs are objective, things you can actually see. Symptoms are something your patient reports. So I realize this is all in uh, Latin here, right, but rubor is redness, okay? You would actually see that. It's a really nice sign of inflammation. Calor is temperature or heat. And so probably heat is a better translation. Um, and, and so you could feel that, right? Like uh, a doctor might actually, right? You've got a inflamed finger or something. You might actually feel it to see if it feels warmer than other fingers. Um, two more, that's going to just be the swelling or edema. Also very visible. Um, dolor is pain. That would be a symptom, right? So the patient is reporting pain. Um, and the pain is actually useful as well, right? Because that often is what limits um, the function, like, right? You don't want it to hurt more, so you stop using um, it. And so that's trying to protect this injured area. Okay, let's look at the actual process here. So um, classic example, so we're stepping on a rusty nail here. It's covered in bacteria, so now we have bacteria in this wound. Now, before the inflammatory response, your initial reaction is to stop bleeding, right? Hemostasis. And so what we see um, is this initial vasoconstriction. But then as we kind of pick up on um, our actual inflammatory response, what we're gonna see is that mast cells, here we go, mast cells in the area, remember these are related to basophils, mast cells release, they're saying chemical mediators, histamine, right? Mast cells release histamine um, and also heparin. So histamine is going to cause vasodilation and it also causes the capillaries to become leakier, right? It opens up. Remember capillaries are endothelial cells. They're actually held together by tight junctions to make sure stuff's just not leaking out um, all the time if you're in a continuous capillary. Anyway, um, so histamine actually kind of relaxes. That makes it easier for things like white blood cells, right? Here we see neutrophils, macrophages um, entering the site of infection. Heparin is a blood thinner, so it's going to help increase blood flow um, to the area, as does vasodilation, right? So we open up this blood vessel um, and we are going to help bring more of those white blood cells past the area of infection, right? So they can smell the chemotatic factors and move towards um, the site of infection. Um, yep. So the other thing that you see kind of leaking out of these capillaries um, or blood vessels is plasma. So this is going to be why we start actually um, getting edema. So as that fluid is leaking out, it's filling the tissue. You actually are able, you're using that to bring fibrinogen to the area. And so you can, um, you can uh, split that. You can make fibrin, right? Remember fibrin from blood clotting? You can actually do that in this area of infection. And so it kind of helps wall off the area so that the bacteria can't just spread um, through the tissue. So there's actually a lot going on here um, in this inflammatory response. Um, pus, they're pointing out here, remember pus is, or purulent exudate would be another term. Um, pus is going to be all that plasma, right? All the fluid, all the dead neutrophils that were kamikaze pilots, dead bacteria, um, all those things. All right, and then last but not least in our innate defenses is fever. Not that kind of fever, that kind of fever, right? So an increased body temperature. So often you'll see um, in our textbook, body temperature being listed in Celsius. So 37 degrees Celsius um, is considered a normal body temperature. Um, basically anything higher um, than 37.2 or 99 degrees Fahrenheit, um, 
you're probably more familiar with, um, is considered a fever. Okay, so fever, this increased body temperature, is actually set up, the hypothalamus in the brain is basically acting as the thermostat for the body. So you can, you have a series of chemicals called pyrogens that actually induce this fever. So pyrogens could be um, from the pathogen itself, right? Something we respond to and kind of turn up the temperature or some of your other white blood cells can actually release. We'd call those endogenous pyrogens, pyrogens that we made ourselves, but also to stimulate um, the hypothalamus to go ahead um, and up the body temperature. And one of the things to think about is like, why would we do this, right? Um, some of it is to probably inhibit microbial growth. It's You're not gonna be able to heat up enough to just straight up like denature the proteins and kill the pathogen without causing a lot of damage in yourself, right? So sometimes a fever can get too high, you start hallucinating, you're denaturing your own proteins, that's bad, okay? So you're typically not using fever to truly kill a microbe, but if you can make the temperature warm enough that it's not in its optimal growth temperature, um, its reproductive rate will slow down. So you can kind of slow down um, the growth of that microbe, and at the same time, you're actually upping the metabolic rate in your own cells. So you can get um, macrophages and lymphocytes and all these white blood cells to actually work um, a little bit faster. Okay. So those are our innate defenses. Again, nonspecific, doesn't care what the microbe is, um, and these are things that you're born with, right? You don't have to have a previous exposure um, in order to have that reaction. All right, I'm going to end this one here, take a quick break, and then we will talk about um, the adaptive defenses.